Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And in this podcast, we'll be talking about a subject that uh, may seem a little bit morbid, but I thought was still worth doing a podcast on. It's the subject of the presence of death. The presence of death. And for some reason, this subject seems to have pushed itself into the forefront for me past week or a couple weeks or so. I'm not sure why, but it seems to have done that just with things I've seen, articles I've read, books I've read, or passages in books that I've read. And we'll explore this theme of the presence of death through a few uh, movies that I've seen recently, and also an article that I also wrote for my site on um, uh, Polydor Virgil's uh, talks about how different cultures deal with the onset of death. So it's an important subject, I think, and even though it may be a, a bit of a gruesome subject, I hope, hope I hope it's not a portent or an augury of anything, but I think it's still a subject that has benefits for us to talk about. So let's start first with the two movies that I'm going to talk about. This, The first movie is the movie Beautiful, uh, 2010 film starring Javier Bardem and beautiful is spelled B-I-U-T-I-F-U-L and this is a movie that I had seen several years ago and it made a positive impression on me and I wanted to see it one more time just to really get the full flavor because with complicated movies with deep movies you miss things the first time around so it's always a good idea to try to see them more than once if you can but this movie is a joint Spanish Mexican production and as directed by the director uh, Alejandro uh, Gonzalez Iñárritu as far as I know far, as far as I remember and again the movie came out in 2010 the general plot of this movie you have uh, uh, a guy it, it's set in the city of Barcelona in Spain and you've got a character named Uxpal played by Javier Bardem, who is obviously a great actor, one of the great actors of of our current generation. And this is a guy who finds out that he only has a few months to live. He's a he's a guy who lives on the wrong side of the of the law. Basically he's a criminal. He's a guy who helps smuggle in illegal Chinese immigrants, uses them as sweatshop labor, sells the goods or brings the goods that they make to these uh, West African street vendors also who are illegal immigrants and you know, takes a cut of what they sell and uses it to pay off police and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is a guy who grew up an orphan, obviously has uh, been playing the wrong side of the law for a long time. But yet at the same time, he's not a bad guy. He's He seems to be a very, very good man, in fact, in many ways, other than what he does for a living. Uh, but everything in this guy's life seems to be going wrong. He has a estranged ex-wife um, whose name is uh, Marambra. And I don't know the name of the the actress who plays this character, but she does a fantastic job, really, really fantastic job. Um, uh, Maricel Alvarez is the name of, of this uh, actress, Marambra. And she's basically a bipolar alcoholic, very, basically a nice, again, a, a good person, but just has behavioral issues. She's an unfit mother. She can't take care of her two children, uh, Anna and Mateo, who are young children who are in the custody of Uxpal. And he finds out that he has uh, only a couple months to live, so he's trying to get his affairs in order. And there's some other plot tw twists. He has a an unscrupulous brother who's also sleeping with his ex-wife, if you can believe that. And and if I didn't mention it before, Uxbal is also psychic. He also has psychic powers. He's able to communicate or at least receive messages from the recently departed, from the recently departed people, people who just die. Now, I know this sounds forced. It sounds maybe... A kind of derivative, but this is a fantastic movie, in my opinion. Some people found it very, very depressing, and in some ways it is. 
But for me, for some some reason, it seemed very life affirming in some ways. It ended on a positive note. It it is it is a sad movie. It deals with very sad themes, but the themes are presented in such a way that it's very dignified. This character Uxbal is raised up from being who might otherwise look like just another grubby street hustler into being a man who is confronting the presence of death with serenity and with, in many ways, stoic fortitude, with stoic fortitude. So it's a, it's a, it's a very good way. And there are scenes in this movie of real power. Um, I won't reveal too much, but the opening scene shows uh, a scene in a, a winter forest where Uxbal is meeting another character. And you don't really understand the significance of this scene until you're about halfway through the movie. And when that really hits you, it's a very, very powerful emotional moment. And it um, it really ties together a lot of things. There's a real mystical element to this movie, which I found very appealing. So I think the message of the, the film is that even though death is always there, and for some of us it comes faster than others, we have to do the best we can to confront it. We have to keep our dignity. We cannot collapse into a ball of fear. And we have to do everything we can to get our affairs in order to depart this world with dignity and self-respect. Because it really does take a lot of courage. If you know that you have two young children to take care of and you're going to be gone very soon, it's not easy. And this guy has enough presence of mind to know that certain things you just don't share with young children. You just can't really share that with them because young children, they expect a father to to be there for them and to be a, a symbol of strength, to be a, a pillar of support and to tell them that the world is going to work out right. And a father in many ways has to be a stoic. He has to absorb the suffering, deal with it the best he can, and try to provide a good life for his children the best he can, even if everything around him is collapsing. And believe me, everything in this guy's life is collapsing. It's just one misfortune piled on top of another. You know, one misfortune filed on top of another. So um, there's an old Egyptian saying, uh, I remember, Falk kul tamme, tamme. You know, one, on top of one misfortune, another misfortune. Um, and that's the impression that you get from from watching this uh, this movie. But very, very deep movie, very, very good, and very much uh, a philosophical exploration of the presence of death. Now, the next movie we're going to look at is a different film with a decidedly different flavor and a very different moral compass. And I saw this yesterday, this film yesterday. It's the film Amor by directed by Michael Haneke, H-A-N-E-K-E. I'm assuming that I'm pronouncing that correctly, Michael Haneke. Um, and uh, this is a movie that came out in 2012. I had, Again, I had heard about it, had never seen it before. But it's a, it's a very depressing and dark film. And the general plot is there you have two, you have a married couple, two people, Georges and, and, and Anne, and they live in Paris in a very comfortable apartment, even if it's a little bit dated. But they're retired music teachers, and they're in their 80s. They're living together. And suddenly we find out that the wife, Anne, has a neurological disorder. She suddenly comes down with a neurological problem, and she tries to get an operation for it. It turns out the operation makes things worse. Then she has a stroke. And this sets her on a path of physical and mental decline. Now, her husband, who is basically a good man, but always seems to convey a, an air of being slightly irritated with everything. This guy does a very good job of becoming his wife's caretaker. He does a, a very, very thorough job and a, a, a very, the very difficult and exhausting and draining job of being a caretaker for his wife as she gets farther and farther down the road to 
the doorstep of death. And, you know, the, the, the film contains very long stretches of footage showing him going through the paces of taking care of her, you know, feeding her, clothing her, washing her, wiping her. And, you know, we're, it, it, all, of the, all of this is, is portrayed in a very deadpan style, a very, the, the, the director's signature deadpan style. And there are some other characters there. There's a, the couple have a young daughter who tries to show up and tries to get them to commit her mother to a home. Uh, there are some caretakers who come over. He hires, the, the, the husband hires some nurses. And there's a very uncomfortable scene where he fires one of the nurses, which is very uncomfortable of a scene but the whole movie explores this idea about when is the right time to depart this life what is the right time to depart this life when is the right time and is it good is it good to take your own life or to encourage someone else to take their own life or to do it yourself you know this is the real moral question that i think this movie explores you know, if we want to dignify it as that, because again, you know, there's something about this movie that really bothered me, because there's something about this director, frankly, that bothers me. This is the same guy that made some other movies that rubbed me the wrong way. He made Funny Games, which is basically a two-hour celebration of torture and, and sadism, and he made a movie called The White Ribbon from 2009, which was a really ponderous and boring. Uh, flagellation about the alleged mentality of um, of uh, certain people in a German village, which could have led to authoritarianism, as if we haven't seen that theme played out a thousand times before in movies. He did do one very, very good movie that I like that I liked very much that I, that I liked very much, and this was Caché, a film called Caché, or in English, Hidden. And this was uh, one of the best studies of grief and repressed rage that I've ever seen. This was about a, um, uh, a comfortable French uh, television personality who's suddenly confronted with, um, uh, with someone from his past whom he wronged when he was a child. And the consequences that he has to deal with that result from that. But Amor is, there's something sadistic about the movie. There's something very morally bereft about it. It seems to almost be an advertisement for euthanasia in some ways. And I didn't like that. And I don't, again, I don't really want to get into the, the whole debate over that. I, 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 I think that's a, certainly a valid debate. And I'm not saying that I don't think that it's appropriate in, in certain extreme situations. But there's just something about this couple that I felt like they missed the boat on. You know, they, they're in their 80s and they have nothing else going on in their lives except each other. They have nothing else going on. They have no diversions. They have no friends. They have no activities. They have no joy, really, except hanging around with each other. And so that when one of them declines and dies, the other one quickly goes to pieces mentally and physically. And, I, you know, I say to myself, I don't ever want to be like that. I don't ever want to be in that situation. I don't ever want to be in that situation where I am dependent, so codependent on someone else that I'm essentially joined at the hip. And I understand, you know, when you're, when you're married to someone for 50 years, 60 years, you, 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 you essentially you, you fuse and you become one person. But... There's got to be a better way. There's got to be other alternatives. Uh, I, I just think this movie, the conclusion of the movie, presents such an extreme departure from what I think the norm is that it makes me think that there's insanity issues lurking in the background here as well. And I just, I think, again, it highlights to me the, the same point that I made when I talked about Beautiful, the previous movie. How you depart this life is just as important as how you live this life. I'll say that again. How you leave this life is just as important as how you live it. And you're going to be judged on that. And if you depart this life in a craven, chicken shit, cowardly manner, everything that you've done before that is going to be tainted by that. And yet, a death, an exit from this world that is noble, that is virtuous, that is courageous, 
in many ways enables you to transcend the immediate circumstances of your death and your life and to maybe approach something that looks a lot like greatness, nobility of soul, magnitudo animi, again. It's just a thought. It's just a thought. Now, the final thing that I'm going to discuss here is the article that I wrote for my site, qcurtius.com, on December 4th, which you can find on my site, posted on December 4th. It's like the previous couple previous couple articles back. And the title of this article was Polydor Virgil's Comments on Death and Burial Customs. And uh, this this article was based on a book that I had uh, been reading at the time by someone you've probably never heard of. This was a, a Renaissance humanist, a, a scholar named Polydor Virgil. He was a diplomat, priest, scholar who lived from 1470 to 1555. And and uh, his most famous book is a, sort of a book of firsts. When I say book of firsts, I mean a book that said the first people that did this, the first guy that invented this, or the first person that did that. Uh, De Inventoribus Rerum uh, is the title of his book, but it's usually translated in English as On Discovery. And it's a, it's a digest of, of firsts. So books like this are always pleasant to read, if only to see what men thought back in those days, because obviously the the shape and flavor of knowledge has advanced a lot since his day. But the charm of these old books really lies in seeing what people thought at that time, you know. And what I liked about this book was he did a survey, going through some classical texts, of how the different peoples of the ancient world uh, handled their uh, citizens who died or their their burial customs. You know, obviously he talks a little lot about how the Egyptians embalmed their dead and he uses Herodotus, the historian Herodotus, and talks about the preparation of Egyptian corpses for, for death. He says that Ethiopians uh, buried their dead in glass coffins and that Scythians buried alive uh, uh, the people that they loved. And there's another group of people, Nasamonas, who I have no idea who, who those are. I suppose I could look it up. He says he buried their dead in a sitting position, you know, which reminded me of, uh, if you've ever read, the, ever read the book King Solomon's Mines, great, fantastic adventure story. There's a scene uh, at the end of the novel where uh, these, these kings are, are buried by being entombed in, in, um, in a cave where they're 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 placed, they're arranged around a table where the drippings, the the stalactites or stalagmites, I forget which is which, but the the drippings of the water on the corpses basically forms the these you know stone pillars around them, and that's how they they um, encase their dead in a sort of a mausoleum of of uh, of cave stone. Um, and then he talks about how different different peoples you know some people throw their dead to the birds and the dogs some preserve their dead in honey and coat them with wax some throw them in dung heaps apparently now again we don't know how much of this is hearsay how much of this is just taking a little bit of truth and expanding it because again a lot of these ancient writers they didn't they didn't firsthand visit a lot of the people that they wrote about they were relying on the accounts of other travelers or other writers so obviously obviously there's going to be some some hyperbole here. But, you know, as we read through this, what we conclude from all this, I, and I think this is the important thing really to take away, is that death has a hold on our consciousness. It, on, no matter what culture we're talking about, no matter what people we're talking about, no matter what era, what age, the handling of the dead how we die and how we handle people who have already died says a lot about us. It's a very important subject. And it's not the type of thing you need to obsess about and think about and, and, and stress about because ultimately that's, that's useless also. That's, that's uh, something that sh you should never really be something you dwell on. But 
it's 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 something that's important and what we conclude from this is that uh, considering how important it is we should really really take pains and prepare ourselves mentally philosophically mentally even physically for that day when we may have to depart this mortal life and we can do it in such a way that brings credit on our memory we have to do things that bring credit on our memory i don't subscribe to the idea that you just check out and you let other people hold holding the bag and you just kind of dump everything on everybody else and it doesn't matter i think it matters i think it matters supremely and it matters transcendentally so start preparing mentally start and again when i say that it doesn't mean that you start thinking about it and obsessing about it and writing about it or talking about it it means you have to know that it's out there you have to be aware that it exists that it's always hovering out there death is always out there flapping his wings over our shoulders and only those who are mindful of death can truly learn how to enjoy life we have to be mindful of death if we really want to enjoy life the two things are connected they're connected and this is really what we have to appreciate and what we have to understand we can never really learn to live life until we understand and are comfortable with the presence of death so that will conclude my podcast for today this is quintus courteous good night